Now, from Coin 6 News, a special presentation. Portland's hidden history, honoring black history. Welcome to Hidden History as we celebrate Black History Month. And we start in our own backyard where African-American women are making big strides in Oregon. And a longtime activist and legislator is making history by being the first black woman on Portland City Council. I can't leave my blackness at home when I come to the office in the morning, and I wouldn't if I, if I could. Um, and so the things that impact the African-American community, I feel. And as you said, I'm the first African-American woman. And so it's a very huge responsibility that I don't take lightly. It's been a long road for Joanne Hardesty. Originally from Baltimore, Maryland, the Navy veteran is a former Oregon legislator, a longtime activist, and former president of the Portland NAACP. She says she was a reluctant city council candidate. I did not want this job. I was just mad. I think the city needs new leadership. I think this city needs people who are going to call it like it is and actually work across lines. Hardesty's way of telling it like it is is already ruffled feathers. The privilege afforded a small group of white men. She called out what she termed white male privilege among people who disrupted city council meetings. Hardesty was also the lone vote against a $100,000 settlement for a fired Portland police sergeant who made racially charged comments at roll call. I was not uh, hesitant about raising these issues at all. I believe that's why Portland voters overwhelmingly voted for me. Hardesty's inspiration was Gladys McCoy, the first black elected official in Oregon. McCoy was elected to the Portland School Board in 1970 and was chair of the Multnomah County Commission. Now, Hardesty is among other black female firsts in Oregon, including Oregon Supreme Court Justice Adrian Nelson and Portland Police Chief Danielle Outlaw. What a wonderful time to be an African-American woman in the United States of America and in Oregon. Um... A small town in Florida has a unique place in American history. Eatonville is the oldest town incorporated by blacks. Rod Carter looks at its impressive 130-year history. About six miles north of Orlando, there sits a small piece of history. And it's controlled absolutely by African Americans. The town of Eatonville, incorporated in 1887, the oldest African American town in the United States. At that time, the blacks and the whites were all together in Maitland. And, and then they just wanted to have something they could call their own. It's named after Josiah C. Eaton, one of a small group of white landowners who were willing to sell their land to blacks at the time. My father built the elementary school. At 100 years old. I thank the Lord, I'm the only one still here. Ella Dinkins is the oldest living resident of a quaint one square mile community of about 2,500 people. She remembers the town in her youth. We only had dirt streets, no sidewalks. Clay, clay, clay Road. Eatonville is one of the few surviving African American settlements formed in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. The mayor credits that to God and the tenacity and the perseverance of the people here. The Eatonville Historic District was designated in 1998 and added to the National Historic Registry. It's comprised of four dozen buildings around the area, including this one. But it's the spirit of the people who call this place home that keeps the history and the heritage going. Remember, this is where we came. We can compare it from then and now. Yes, ma'am. I know I can. <laughs> In Eatonville, I'm Rod Carr. A little Kansas town with a big history has a rarely told story about survival after slavery. Ashanti Ford visited Nicodemus, Kansas, the only remaining western town established by freed slaves to retrace the steps of history. Slavery produced in us um, a spirit of determination. And tenacity to build and sustain an entire town from the ground up. Freed slaves from Kentucky were solicited to move to Nicodemus, Kansas for a new start, but they arrived to harsh conditions. What you have is a situation where people are pretty much starving to death and multiple claims on the land. The Osage as well as the Potawatomi both claim that they've been here to Nicodemus. The native people helped the former slaves survive their first winter in the harsh conditions. And at its height, the town was populated by 600 people. 
They built their own schools, churches, stores, and banks. The residents of Nicodemus used their skills learned during slavery and created a new life for themselves. But a promised railroad never came, and the Depression hit the town hard. Today, there's only a few dozen residents. A town with a history built on freedom and hope. And we spoke to some of those that live in the community about how they're keeping their town's history alive. I am a sixth generation descendant of one of the first families that came to Nicodemus. I come from the Williams line of the family. This is my great grandfather, uh, Neil Williams. I'm a Cannon and Jones, um, which were descendants of the Slaughters and Dorseys. Each year since 1877, the Emancipation Celebration brings crowds of people back to Nicodemus to celebrate a shared history. I think that being a part of the families of Nicodemus and knowing that uh, our forefathers endured slavery and then they came to the West and had the vision to help to establish an all-black town and govern themselves. I mean, that's something to be very, very proud of. In Nicodemus, Kansas, I'm Ashanti Ford. Lessons from the grave. A man's life and death is providing a very personal look at life as a slave in America. Scott McDonnell has that story. <laughs> In Waterbury, Connecticut, a peculiar headstone. It took 215 years for a proper burial of the man named Fortune. Your history is in the bones. In the two centuries, his bones have been on an unbelievable journey. Mr. Fortune, the, the skeleton uh, that we were looking at, was owned by this surgeon in Waterbury. Um, he was probably working on his land. Fortune was owned as a slave. I think a lot of people don't realize how prevalent slavery still was in the Northeast. Researchers and students from Quinnipiac University were able to study the skeleton of Fortune. He was extremely robust. And gain rare insight into what life was like as a New England slave. From lifestyle to diet. It's feathering along the edge of the skull. It's due to nutritional deficiencies. Disrespect in life and in death. The man who owned Fortune was a physician. Bones were passed down from generation to generation. From generation to generation. The family used his skeleton to study osteology. It is kind of a strange juxtaposition to know that, you know, the very reason that he was used by the bone surgeon is also what ended up giving us some kind of evidence of what his life was like. After two centuries, a ceremony held at Connecticut State Capitol. We participated in the, the process of the burial, the funeral. And Fortune's bones were put into a coffin. And through it all, a journey forcing all of us to look at a disturbing past. Knowing your history means that you can kind of change your future. For Hidden History, I'm Scott McDonald. Coming up next on Hidden History, we'll take you to South Alabama and the search for the ship that brought the last slaves to America more than 150 years ago. And a recently discovered slave cemetery uncovers the hidden history for their descendants. Welcome back to Hidden History as we celebrate Black History Month. It has been quite a year for the small Alabama community of Africatown. Many people who live there are direct descendants of the last slaves brought to the U.S. from Africa aboard a ship called the Clotilda. For decades, people have been looking for the remains of the Clotilda, and this year they think it might have been found. Bill Reales has that story. Shortly before Christmas 2017, environmental reporter Ben Raines thought he'd uncovered the final resting place of the Clotilda. He revealed the finding in January 2018, and for a few weeks, people in the community of Africatown were in the spotlight. It would have let us know that our history was real, and it was told from the mouth of people that were on that ship. That history is the story of 110 people stolen from the African nation of Dahomey, now known as Benin, and forced into slavery in America just before the Civil War began more than 150 years ago. It was a mission born on a bet between wealthy landowners that they could evade federal law and bring slaves into the country. Slave trading had been illegal for more than 50 years. To hide the evidence, the captain burned Clotilda to the waterline. This is believed to be the spot where the journey for the 110 slaves on 
on board the Clotilda ended. This is St. Louis Point. It's right along the Mobile River and below the Cochrane Africatown Bridge. They have long hoped for the discovery of the remains of the two-masted schooner Clotilda. The excitement grew until March when it was announced that the ship that Mr. Raines found, which is being called the 12 Mile Island Shipwreck, is simply too big. Archaeologists from the National Park Service and NOAA, among others, launched an expedition in July to try to find the Clotilda in the same area of the Mobile River Delta where Raines found the other shipwreck. They think it's within possibly a stone's throw of where we were, but certainly within a half mile to a mile. In Africatown, I'm Bill Riles. In Maryland, a long forgotten slave cemetery tucked deep in the woods of a former tobacco plantation was just uncovered. As Morgan Wright reports, archaeologists have also discovered slave quarters and descendants of slaves who once worked and lived on the land. Deep in the forest, sisters Wanda Watts and Shelly Evans walk in the footsteps of their ancestors. The two women share a frustration common to many African Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in America. We have no history. We begin and we end here. But thanks to a recent and accidental discovery, the sisters may have uncovered their family's hidden history on this piece of land. My uh, three times great grandmother was born here. Evans and Watts are the descendants of slaves who lived, worked, and may have died here on what was the Belvoir Plantation. Dr. Julie Shablitsky is the chief archaeologist with the Maryland Department of Transportation. We were initially looking for the Rochambeau encampment, which was during the American Revolution. But instead, they found slave quarters built in the 1780s and lived in until emancipation in 1864. The land was a tobacco plantation once owned by relatives of Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. A former resident of the property tipped Dr. Shablitsky's team off to what they thought could be a slave cemetery tucked along a ravine deep in the woods. They found nearly half a dozen pieces of broken marble and stones resembling grave markers, but to be sure, Dr. Shablitsky brought in cadaver dogs. For me, it was the knowledge of them being buried someplace um, rather than being tossed away. But even so, they may never know for certain if their family is actually buried here at Belvoir. In Crownsville, Maryland, Morgan Wright. Dr. Shabliski says there are no immediate plans for the uncovered slave cemetery. The slave quarters have been fully excavated and the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration plans to add interpretive panels to the site. Coming up, we'll show you how an army fort on the East Coast became a gateway to freedom for hundreds of slaves during the Civil War. Just a stone's throw from some of the most popular beaches in Virginia, you'll find historic Fort Monroe. The former Army post played a major role in the Civil War, and it also served as the gateway to freedom for thousands of enslaved African Americans. As Don Roberts reports, at least one historian compares the fort to New York's famed Ellis Island. The Ellis Island, New York, was the gateway to freedom for millions of European immigrants. They fled poverty and oppression for a chance to achieve the American dream. Well, one noted historian says there was another Ellis Island for African Americans. In 1619, a ship with about 20 African captives comes into the Chesapeake Bay, lands at Fort Monroe, um, which was then called Fort Algernon. It really started with three very brave young men, Frank Baker, James Townsend, and Shepard Mallory, who were enslaved men in the Hampton Roads area. They had been conscripted, um, forced basically, into providing labor for the Confederate Army. They escaped and they came to the fort and presented themselves to the Union sentries and asked to be sheltered. Shortly after Baker, Townsend, and Mallory made their way through those gates and were given asylum here at Fort Monroe, the word spread like wildfire, and within months, hundreds of escaped slaves made their way to the fort and were also given asylum. They were declared contraband of war. The word continued to spread, and shortly after that, thousands of escaped slaves found their way to Fort Monroe. Being declared contraband meant they were still considered property, and they were put to work for the Union Army in the fields wherever needed until emancipation in 1863. I'm Don Roberts reporting.
The park will recognize the contraband history with a week of activities in May. And Fort Monroe is planning to open a new visitor center in August. It'll pay tribute to the contraband. Well, coming up on Hidden History, known as perhaps the greatest and most famous athlete in track and field history, we'll take you to the place that shaped Jesse Owens. His accomplishments were monumental in the 20th century, but the impact the Alabama native had on the sporting world is still felt today, decades after his death. Jack Royer traveled to the Jesse Owens Museum, where his legacy lives on in the same spot where his life began. He was born here. He picked cotton right here where we're standing. This land looks a lot different than it did the last time Jesse Owens saw it himself. Long before the world famous athlete heard a starter pistol, he spent nine hard years living on this land in northwest Alabama. Welcome to the Owens family home. Where a replica of his childhood home now reminds visitors that adversity never stopped Jesse Owens' will to win. The youngest of ten children, many of them living together in a house like this, a replica on the family property. They had a hard life here. <laughs> Nothing come easy for him. But winning would soon come easily for him after his family moved to Ohio, where his unheard of success at Ohio State University earned him a greater controversial opportunity. By America's black streak, Jesse Owens in the 100 meter. The world's most superb runner makes the others look as if they're walking. In front of the world, Owens embarrassed Nazi Germany. Dedicated in 1996, the museum displays the history of Owens' life for all to see attracting thousands of visitors every year, many not realizing he was born right here in Alabama. People will argue with you about that, actually. Jesse Owens would continue those impacts until his death in 1980. His birthplace, perhaps hard to find, but it's also hard to forget, as the impact he had on the sporting world paved a way for today's athletes to succeed. Coming up, we'll show you how a Washington, D.C. museum hopes to relieve racial tensions with law enforcement through the story of an African-American sheriff in the Deep South. Throughout history, we've seen mistrust between certain groups and the police. A museum in Washington, D.C. hopes to strengthen relationships by highlighting the history of law enforcement and having open dialogue about its future. Bree Jackson tells us about the significant role one man played in improving public safety and race relations. This badge, these sunglasses, and this nameplate belong to a pioneer in law enforcement and civil rights. Lucius Amerson was the first African-American sheriff elected in the Deep South since Reconstruction. Before that, a, a largely African-American population in Macon County was not able to vote for their sheriff. Rebecca Looney is director of exhibits and programs at the National Law Enforcement Museum. She says Amerson was an Army veteran who became sheriff of Macon County, Alabama in the late 1960s following the passage of the Voting Rights Act. She says many saw his election as a sign of progress for black Americans fighting for equality and against police brutality. It's a big step forward. I mean, we say that law enforcement um, needs to reflect our community. Lucius Amerson's story represents a defining moment in law enforcement history. Today, police departments nationwide acknowledge that maintaining and recruiting a diverse workforce is still a challenge. Recent headlines have focused on the Black Lives Matter movement and the lack of trust between police and the public. Craig Floyd, CEO of the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund, says he hopes the museum can play a part in easing those tensions. We're going to have thoughtful, important conversations between the public and law enforcement. The museum hopes sharing the stories of Sheriff Lucius Amerson, as well as the stories of men and women of all races who have given their lives in the line of duty, will help visitors better understand the vital role diversity plays in keeping our communities safe. In Washington, Bree Jackson. We want to thank you for taking the time to celebrate Black History Month with us and exploring our hidden history. For a look at all these stories and more, be sure to check out our website, coin.com.